Merry Christmas, everybody. Good morning. How you guys doing? Morning. Got some more people here this week. <coughs> Hope everybody made it home safely. That was here last week. I haven't heard any any bad reports, but it was pretty snowy, and it was pretty snowy. <laughs> well, I'm still still a little sick. Not much of a voice, but we got these great ladies up here that are gonna help out and they're gonna sing today. So that means you have to sing extra loud to help us out. So let's stand, we're gonna worship this morning, sing some great Christmas songs. We're gonna start with angels we have heard on high. Let's stand. Sunday of Advent. For the last three weeks, we have focused our attention on the true meaning of Christmas by adding one candle each week to our wreath. Each candle has reminded us of an aspect of the Christmas story. The first Sunday was a prophet's candle. The second Sunday, we added Mary's candle. Last Sunday, we lit the angels and shepherds candle. This morning, we add the last purple candle to our lighting. This candle is called the candle of the wise men. This candle symbolizes that it was not enough for the wise men to simply be aware of the Savior's ex existence. It demanded a response from them. So they sought him out to honor and worship him. Like the wise men, we can still seek and find the Savior. Our appropriate response to the Savior at Christmas and every other time of the year is to honor and worship him. We all need to come to Jesus and lay our lives before him to receive peace and eternal life. Matthew 2, 1 through 11. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We have seen his star as it arose, and we have come to worship him. Herod was deeply disturbed by their question, as was all of Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law. Where did the prophets say the Messiah would be born, he asked them. In Bethlehem, they said. For this is what the prophet wrote, O Bethlehem of Judah, you are not just a lowly village in Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. Then Herod sent a private message to the wise men, asking them to come see him. <coughs> At this meeting, he learned the exact time. Then Herod sent a private message to the wise men, asking them to come see him. At this meeting, he learned the exact time when they first saw the star. He told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me 
so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way. Once again, the star appeared to them, guiding them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house where the child and his mother, Mary, were, and they fell down before him and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Christmas season. We thank you for the reason of that Christmas season. We thank you for the great gift that you have given to us. Father, we ask that this morning and every morning from this point on, that we bow before you, that we learn to worship and honor you just as the wise men did, to open whatever gifts that you've already given us and offer them as an offering to you. In your holy name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's stand in worship. Fields and homes 
seated. We have a special song now. I think you'll know it, so uh, feel free to sing along if you know this one. This is Breath of Heaven. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see many more of you than we had last week. I preached to a lot of empty chairs last week and people online, uh, so it's good to see your smiling faces here this morning. Uh, we're going to touch in Luke chapter 2 to begin with, then we're going to hop to Matthew 2 and have a stop off in 1 Corinthians 13, if you want to find all of those spots in your copy of God's Word. You may have heard this uh, phrase before that says that music is the language of the soul. Have you heard that one before? Maybe something similar, the language of the heart or something like that. Uh, it, 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 in a really, in a, in a very true sense, that's real. 
because music has a way of sticking with us long after other ideas have faded away. And, and as a result, many of us have become, over the course of our lives, walking repositories of music lyrics. Or is that just me? I, I think we accumulate those things, whether we, whether we realize it or not. And, and there's this subconscious soundtrack going in our head that follows us throughout our lives. Uh, and those song lyrics, many of them color the way that we view the world, even without our realizing it. And sometimes that's a good thing. And it really largely depends on what kind of music you listen to, because it could be a really bad thing as well. Uh, but I, I think out of all of the different genres of music, some of the most easily recognizable music anywhere and the ones that really stick with us the most uh, are, is the music of Christmas. And many of you, you, you just hear a few strains of a Christmas song and you know it. And the lyrics are right there in your head. Uh, for instance, you, you probably were very familiar with every song that we sang this morning. In particular, that one that said, Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, talking about we three kings of Orient are. Uh, and uh, that, that, for instance, is, is a really good song. Uh, the only problem is we don't really know if it's accurate or not. Uh, we don't know whether there were three of those guys, and we... We know almost certainly they were not kings, even though we sing, we three kings of Orient are, they were not kings. And it's almost fairly certain that they were not from what we would consider to be the Orient, even though, again, we sing the song, we three kings of Orient are. Uh, the Orient meant something else way back when than what we mean. When we talk about the Orient, we think about Asia, China, that, those, those kinds of things. Uh, and these guys almost certainly were not from that region. And as I was thinking about that particular song this week, I started thinking about the kings of Christmas. And even though these guys weren't in particular kings, there were indeed some kings that were an integral part of that first Christmas. Each of those kings had his own set of concerns, his own priorities, and his own reasons for ordering the world the way that it was. And each of those kings, I think, has something that he can teach us in how he approached the first Christmas. The, the first king we find in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, where it says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. That's the way the Christmas account begins in Luke's gospel. And it begins with those words, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the king. Go ahead and throw that first picture up there. This is a statue of Caesar Augustus. So I'm sure there was a little bit of artistic liberty taken to make him look better. But generally, that's the way that Caesar Augustus looked. So when you read in the biblical account of Caesar Augustus, that's who it's talking about. Uh, Caesar Augustus was his royal name. Uh, his actual name was Gaius Octavius. And he was the great nephew of Julius Caesar. Uh, when Julius Caesar was murdered, his will named Gaius as his adopted son and the heir to the throne. But that doesn't mean that, that Gaius suddenly had everything handed to him on a silver platter. You may have heard the name of his, in, names in history before of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. You've all heard of those people, right? They were rivals of Gaius Octavius whenever he was trying to seize power. And so he had to begin his reign over, as emperor of Rome by fighting them for control of the empire. And, and he had a lot of concerns going on. Anytime there was a changeover in power, there were a lot of fires to put out, a lot of things that, that demanded his attention. So as you can imagine, with all of the pressures of, of trying to seize his empire and run it centered out of Rome, Caesar had very little time and attention to give to insignificant backwaters like the Middle Eastern provinces. He didn't care much about what was going on in Judah. <clears throat> All he cared about was that people behaved, did what they were told, and paid their taxes. And if he did that, he didn't care what else went on. So you ask yourself, this king of Christmas, what can this king, who is only so briefly mentioned in the Christmas account, what can he teach us about this day? Well, he was a man of power and influence, and he had a lot on his plate to deal with. After all, he had an empire to run. He had critical issues to see to, important people to see, things that only he as the emperor could do. And therein lay a certain amount of danger. 
Because in all of the things that only he could do that he had to be a part of, and his world centered around Rome, it caused him to be blind to the greatest event in human history because he was too busy with what he thought was important at the time. He cared nothing for Jews. He cared even less for Jewish messiahs. He had his own idols to worship and his own power to secure. He had no interest outside of in anything of his own immediate concerns. And, and looking at him and his example, I think that there's, there's a, a really frightening similarity into how we approach life. Because many of us think that we are so important that if we are not intimately involved in something, the whole world's going to stop. That if I'm not there and I'm not doing this, then there's going to be absolute disaster. And because of this mindset, many of us live in the tyranny of the important, things that we consider to be important. We have things that have to get done. We have places that we have to be. And so we rush from place to place and event to event and even from crisis to crisis, barely taking time to breathe, firmly convinced that only we can deal with these things. And certainly in the midst of our list of very important things, we spend very little time to even think about the Jewish Messiah who was born as Savior of the world. I think Caesar, with his haughty indifference to the eternal significance or significant events of the first Christmas, I think that he teaches us something really important. He teaches us the need to pause and pay attention to the things that are of true eternal significance. That's one of the reasons why we celebrate Advent as, as part of our celebration of Christmas leading up the four weeks before Christmas Day to help us to pause, reflect, and really understand why, why we celebrate Christmas and who it is that we are really worshiping. Uh, Caesar, I think, teaches us how easy it is to be focused on the wrong things. Even though they're important and maybe even good, if they take the place of the Lord and seize our attention away from him, they become the wrong things. And we're busy watching over here, trying to deal with this, while God is busy moving over here, and we miss it entirely. He teaches us that, that we really have a need to refocus on the eternal, and we need to reprioritize our spiritual needs, and not just focus on the immediate mundane details on life, but really spend time investing in our spiritual selves. And there is no better time to do that than at Christmas. And so even though Caesar Augustus, we would not consider him to be a good man, and we would not consider him to be a major player in, in the Christmas narrative, except for issuing this tax decree, I think that we can learn a lot from his mistakes and not repeat them for ourselves. Now let's think about king number two, King Herod. We're going to find him in Matthew's gospel, chapter two, beginning in verse one. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and the scribes of the, of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because that, this is what is written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me, so that I too can go and worship him. Yeah, right, Herod. Uh, we all know the uh, famous Dr. Seuss classic, The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, right? We read about the Grinch with his heart two sizes too small, looking down from his mountain upon Whoville, pondering how he could stop Christmas from coming. If ever there were a real-life Grinch, it would be King Herod. 
King Herod even looked down from his mountain overlooking the first Christmas village of Bethlehem. Uh, Herod's mountain was called the Herodium. Archaeologists have, have, have uncovered this. Uh, it was a man-made skyscraper, uh, and it, it was just absolutely huge. It might have been the largest structure at that time in the ancient world. And, and it was built just three miles from Bethlehem. It was one of four fortresses that Herod had, had constructed. And, and, that, and that's a, an aerial view of it, looking down, where you kind of see that hollowed out at the top of this mountain was this crater. And, and this was an entire palace complex. Uh, and it was more than, than just a luxurious residence. It was a fortress that loomed over Bethlehem. Uh, Show that next picture. That is a side view of the Herodium. They actually built a mountain so that they could could place this palace there. Uh, It it was built to house a thousand soldiers and the royal family for a period of a full year. It had huge storage bins for food. It had plenty of fresh water. And thanks to aqueducts that stretched all the way to Jerusalem, that supply was pretty much secured. And, And at the base of that mountain, there was even an opulent swimming pool that was twice the size of an Olympic pool. And it was surrounded by gardens. You saw how dry and dusty that picture was, right? You know how much water they had to pump in to fill that pool and make sure that that garden survived? It was a massive manpower effort. And, and you got into the palace itself and, and the Herodium, it, it, like other palaces that, that, that Herod had made, like at Masada, for instance, uh, the artwork was absolutely stunning. Master craftsmen, they would create priceless works of art in mosaic tile. There were steam baths that waited for the royal guests. The palace bedrooms were situated in such a way that breezes all the way from the Mediterranean Sea would flow through that area because they were at such a high altitude. And it was the closest thing in the ancient world that you would get to air conditioning. They had the best of food, the best of wine, the best of, for the richest guests that would come. And even today, thousands of years later, that cone-like shape of the Herodium can still be seen from Bethlehem. King Herod, it was pretty obvious when you look at examples like this. It's obvious that he had everything a person could want. He lived a lavish lifestyle. He had every luxury that money could buy. He had political power. He had servants that were at his beck and call to take care of his least little whim. And he had soldiers that were ready and willing to march out of his fortresses and enforce his will across the entire province. He was the unquestioned power in this area. And yet in the midst of his power and plenty, his soul had shriveled and become evil. Much like the fictional Grinch His heart was several sizes too small. When faced with exotic visitors who told him that a new king had been born right under his nose, this monstrous man knew what it meant. He knew that the Messiah had been born. I want you to go back and look very carefully at verse 4, Matthew 2, 4. It said, so he assembled all the chief priests, he being Herod, he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would been born, had been born. Uh, notice what it does not say. He asked the priests and scribes to tell him, uh, d- did not ask them to tell him what they were talking about. He already knew what they were talking about. All he needed to know is where was this going to happen? You see, even though he was a monstrous man, uh, he was still of Jewish descent and he would have grown up hearing all of the prophecies that a Messiah was coming. And so he recognized that immediately. And he knew what, he just needed to know where. And you can bet, knowing King Herod, that it wasn't because he wanted to send a fruit basket, welcoming the bundle of joy into the world. He had something much more nefarious in mind. Uh, Matthew 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. 
A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. Herod was mean. He was murderous. He was determined to destroy any perceived threat to his power, even if that perceived threat was the biggest blessing that the world had ever seen. This, in a very real sense, was the king that presided over the first Christmas. What can an awful king like this, though, what can he teach us? Well, I think much like Herod, we do not react well to things that upset our carefully mapped out plans and our preconceived ideas of how things should go. He had a very rigid structure in his mind. This is the way the world is. This is the way the world is going to be. And I will tolerate no deviation from it. And when that deviation happened, he reacted with disproportionate violence. And I think that much like Herod, if we are not careful when things deviate from our carefully laid plans and our preconceived ideas... It is easy for us to become mean and vicious without even meaning to. And I think at times like this, around Christmas, that tendency is magnified. There was a little girl that was named Mary Beth who who found herself caught up in the swirl of pre-Christmas activity. And all of it seemed to be coming to a head on Christmas Eve. Her, her dad was always scurrying about, loaded down with bundles and burdens. Her, her mom was under pressure of getting ready for the big day because dinner was going to be at their house. And, and all through the day, she succumbed to tears uh, leading up to that, just under the stress of getting ready. And, and, and the little girl tried her best, as children will do, but to help her parents. But she found that she was always getting in, her, in their way. And, and they would snap at her, not now, Mary Beth, can't you see I'm busy? I got to get this done. And finally, near tears herself, uh, little Mary Beth was hustled off to bed. And there, kneeling down at her bedside, as she said her prayers, her heart and her tongue became intertwined, and she prayed this. Forgive us our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. And I think that's closer to the truth than we would like to admit. We get uptight. We get short and snappy. We're so focused on trying to create this perfect idealized thing that doesn't really exist. And we allow ourselves to become mean in the process and become part of the things that destroy the illusion instead of moving us closer toward it. I think perhaps the best thing that Herod can teach us is how not to act at Christmas time. Do not be angry. Do not feel threatened when things don't go just right. Do not wallow in a cesspool of selfishness in which you think that the world revolves around you and what you want and how you want things to go. Instead, remember the love that motivated our Lord to send his only begotten son into the world. A love that is supposed to take root in our own hearts and then find expression through us. As we celebrate our Savior and his coming into the world... This should not be a time of short words and short tempers. This should be a time when we most let his nature shine forth from us. What does that look like? Well, the Apostle Paul told us in his letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. The Apostle Paul said, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not, is not boastful. 
It's not arrogant. It's not rude. Even in Walmart. It's not self-seeking. Even when someone else grabs the last package of toilet paper in front of you. Love is not irritable and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Later on in that chapter, toward the end of it, Paul said, now there are three things, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Should this not be the way our Christmases go? Should this not be the center of our celebration? Should not our every word, deed, expression, and action, should it not reflect this spirit? For this is the true spirit of Christ. Instead of allowing the season to bring out the worst in you, open your heart to God's greatest gift to the world and rejoice letting him bring out the best that he has made within you. And now, let's move on to number three. We're going to fudge here just a little bit, because I told you at the beginning that these guys were not really kings, and they didn't really show up until well after Jesus was born, but they're commonly referred to as kings, and they're included in our nativity set, so I'm going to go ahead and include them in this list, okay? Because I'm the preacher, and I can. (laughs) Uh, So we're going to talk about the wise men. Uh, We were already introduced to these guys as we read Matthew's account uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, They've they've been called lots of things. They've been called wise men. They've been called royal astrologers, even kings. Sometimes they're called magi. Uh, Tradition says, tradition, I underline that word, tradition says that there were three of them that were named Gaspar, Melchior, and Baltazar. There is no biblical basis for those names and no biblical basis for the number of them that there actually were. Uh, We get to the number three, most likely because there were three gifts given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And and I always have to say, every time I I read those three gifts, I I always think of an infomercial where where the guy says, but wait, there's more. And I I think of him giving the two gifts, but wait, there's myrrh. (laughs) You'll get that later. And, and groan, probably, when you're trying to take a nap this afternoon. Uh, there, there were at least two of these guys, probably more of them. Uh, but the, the, the term the Bible uses to refer to them is magai. And uh, that, that word was a special word that referred to a special class of Persian wise men who interpreted special signs. And as we noted earlier, these guys did not come from the Orient. They did not come from Asia. They most likely came from the region around ancient Babylon, which means that that would be modern-day Iraq, if you want to try to place it on the map. Uh, That was still a really good distance away uh, from Israel by the terms of of New Testament travel. And and you ask yourself, why why would anybody in a region so far away from Israel, why would they even think about this? Why would a star mean anything to them? Why would they even go in search of a Jewish king that had, that had been born? Well, there's some reasons for this. Uh, the Babylonians, if you remember your Old Testament history, they had many opportunities to learn about Jewish culture and Jewish religion and the Jewish scriptures. Uh, they, they, they had a lot of interaction with these peoples. And uh, those scriptures, they had multiple promises of the coming Messiah. Remember, for instance, the prophet Daniel. Uh, He was an influential government official in Babylon about 600 years prior to the coming of Christ. And he foretold the coming of the Messiah. That's in Daniel chapter 9 if you want to read it for yourself. 
there were also tens of thousands of Jews that lived in Babylon during the time of the exile. Uh, and uh, even after many of them were allowed to return to their, their ancestral homes in Israel, they maintained, the Jewish people maintained, a very large presence in the region of Babylon for centuries following that event. So, so in light of the influence that the, their people had been able to have in this area, it's really not been so surprising that visitors from the east would be familiar with prophecies of a coming Messiah and that they would be alert to a sign that would lead them to said Messiah. And while we don't know how many of these wise men there were or exactly what town they were from, one thing we do know for certain about these wise men. They came fully expecting to behold a child who was born king of the Jews. We see that in Matthew 2.2. 2. They came saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. That expectation that he was born king of the Jews is probably why they went first to Jerusalem and met with Herod. Because where else would you expect to find a newborn king than in the seat of local government? Uh, though, we don't, though we're not given a ton of details about these wise men, uh, I, I think that they still have a lot to, to tell us, to teach us in their part of the Christmas narrative. Consider this. Uh, they left home on a long journey with nothing but a prophecy and a sign. How many of you would do that? Nothing but a prophecy and a sign that you just strike out from home and go. That speaks, I think, volumes about their confidence in the miraculous nature of the sign that they saw. I, I said this Wednesday night to, the, to our Bible study group. You'll, you'll be seeing on Facebook and stuff a lot of things about the quote-unquote Christmas star or star of Bethlehem that, that's supposed to be in the sky this week. I think it's actually tomorrow night that the Jupiter and Saturn are supposed to come into conjunction and create a bright star in the heavens, and, and they're calling it the star of Bethlehem. It is not the star of Bethlehem. Let me tell you, this thing was special. It was supernatural. It moved across the sky. It was not just a fixed point. And, and there were lots of things that, that, that shows us that, that it was different than, than just what was ordinary. They looked at this and they saw something that did not match their experience. And they were convinced that the hand of God was at work and that they needed to follow it. They were obviously convinced that it was worth the cost in time and treasure for them to go all of this way. But imagine that there were probably plenty of people left at home who thought that they were crazy. What do you mean you're following a star? Which star? There are millions of them up there, billions of them. Why would you go and do that? Why would you go all the way to Israel? You know what that place is like? That's just nuts. And yet these men, they left home because they had faith that they had indeed been given a specific, special sign. Even if nobody else could understand what they saw in this particular star, they knew with every fiber of their being that something extraordinary was happening and they needed to be a part of it. And so they set out from their homeland with a mission and a purpose. Their purpose was to worship him. Their mission was to find him. Their purpose is our purpose. And their mission is our mission. We must find the king and worship him exclusively. Substitutes will not do. But the good news is that finding him is oh so easy. We don't have to travel all the way to Bethlehem. He is here ready to meet us. Easy to find, but what remains is for us to be willing to bend our knee before him and worship him as Savior, as King, and as Lord of Lords. And we worship him with the best of ourselves. Now, before you say to yourself, well, I'm in church today, so I can check that one off my list. Not so fast. 
Their worship was not the act of an hour. Their worship was born out of a lifetime of study, followed by months, if not a year or more, of personal sacrifice as they sought out this newborn king. To worship him, really worship him, is not something that can be done only in a church service. Now, coming and gathering together as his people, that's part of our worship. But that is not the entirety of our worship. It must be something that is a huge part of your life, not just something that can easily be shunted off to the margins. And let's be honest, if you're only giving the Lord one hour out of every week, then he has shunted into the margins. When we come to the, to the king, it, we must have a complete giving of ourselves. Just as these men did. They gave their skill. They gave their time. And they gave their treasure. And that's what we need to give to the Lord. Our Christmas holiday season is surrounded, immersed, and even defined by Herod-like wealth and luxury. But let me tell you, the best Christmases are not the ones that are spent surrounded by piles of presents. The best Christmases are spent kneeling before the King of Kings and giving him the best that you have to offer. Now, there's one more king that we must not forget in the Christmas narrative. And let's find him in Matthew 2, 11. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. The most important king of Christmas was the Christ child. Jesus, Emmanuel, <coughs> God with us, King of kings, Lord of lords. We must never forget that he stands at the center of Christmas, at the center of life, at the center of all creation itself. In him, we have life and hope and a future. In him, we have reason to celebrate with good joy. Even if the rest of life is not so fun. In Jesus. In Jesus. We have what we need. On Christmas Eve, 1906, Reginald Fessenden, a 33-year-old university professor who was also a former chief chemist for Thomas Edison, he did something that people had for a long time thought was absolutely impossible. He used a new type of generator that he had invented, and doing so, uh, Fessenden spoke into a microphone, and for the first time in history, a man's voice was broadcast over radio waves. Before, all they could do was send coded pulses that, that people would, would hear over tiny little speakers and then they'd have to interpret the pulses and, and uh, get, get a message out of that. Fessenden leaned into his microphone in a clear, strong voice, hoping, not knowing, but hoping that uh, it would be heard. He read... And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Did you know that the Christmas narrative was the very first thing transmitted on radio waves? And there were shocked radio operators on ships all around because he was broadcasting from Massachusetts. And, and uh, they, they heard him out in the Atlantic. And, and there were astonished wireless operators who were sitting in uh, newspaper rooms waiting to hear reports from across the country. And they sat slack-jawed as their normal coded impulses were suddenly interrupted by this professor reading from the Gospel of Luke. And to the few people who caught this broadcast live, um, it, it, it must have seemed in that moment like a miracle. Hearing a voice somehow transmitted to those far away and 
Uh, there were reports that some of them even thought they were hearing the voice of an angel as the, the content was heard. Uh, Fessenden was probably unaware of the sensation that he was causing on the ships and offices. Uh, he could not have known that men and women were rushing to their wireless units to catch this Christmas Eve miracle. After finishing his recitation of the birth of Christ, uh, Fessenden picked up his violin and he played O Holy Night, the first song ever sent over the radio waves. It was an event that literally changed the world. You wouldn't be holding your supercomputers in your pockets that you can talk on to anybody around the world at any time if not for this pioneering moment that proved this was possible. It really did change everything. The first Christmas was an event that changed things in a much more significant way than realizing a voice could be heard across the world. A voice could be heard across eternity. A voice could be heard that would not just recite the gospel, but the gospel itself calling men and women into relationship with their creator. Allowing them to be forgiven. To be made completely new. This is what God has done. This is what it means for him to be Emmanuel. God with us. This is what it means for him to be our king. May we be like those folks rushing to the wireless to hear the gospel anew. May we be like the wise men of old who traveled far and gave much so they could worship him. May we not be like those other kings who were too busy, too threatened, too self-centered to give him any time at all. May we instead give him everything. Would you pray with me? Father, we pray that you would transform this Christmas for us. Don't let it be like the little girl who said, forgive us our Christmases. But instead, let this be one that shines forth gospel-centered characterized by love and such a time of joy for your people that it will shine from them just as the Christmas stars shone in the sky so that people will see and want to follow. We pray, Lord, this morning that you would forgive us where we have put our attention in the wrong place, where we have followed the wrong things. And this morning, Lord, set us on a journey to the manger. We ask these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we open the altar before you if the Lord has challenged you. If there is maybe a word you've heard and you thought, that's, that's all about me. This is your opportunity to respond to what he said to you. You can come and kneel down here in his presence and pray. I'm going to be over here to the side. I'm happy to pray with you. Grab me on your way by. Let him challenge you. Let him change you. Let him make this the best Christmas that you have experienced in a long time because he's in the center of it. You come today as he calls you. Would you please stand? We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We Thank you.
the greatness of your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry. you this morning. Uh, first, no Wednesday services this week, so do not come expecting to eat dinner at church Wednesday because you'll get hungry. Uh, so no Wednesday service, but we will be here on Thursday evening uh, at 530 for our candlelight Christmas Eve service, and you will want to be here for that. That is, uh, frankly, my favorite service out of the entire year. It is simple, it is uh, brief, and it is incredibly moving as we uh, center ourselves with scripture and song on the meaning of Christmas, and then we'll celebrate communion together and sing Silent Night by Candlelight. It's just a wonderful time. So be here 5.30 on Christmas Eve, which is Thursday. All right, any other announcements? All right, seeing none, I want everyone to smile really big. Bigger? Bigger. Y'all are kind of scary now. And say, really meaning it, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And we're dismissed.